Great. Hello. Um, you are at the Northwest Community Transportation Network public meeting about uh, the 60% design process. Glad to have you. We are going to wait a few minutes for um, other folks to be able to join us. And if you just be patient for a few moments, we'll get started. Thank you. Hola a todos. Ahorita están en la reunión de la red de transporte comunitaria en el noroeste de Denver. Vamos a esperar unos momentos más para que todos puedan iniciar la sesión. Así que solo estén pacientes por unos momento, momentos más y comenzaremos. Gracias. Hey, hello, for those who have just joined in the last minute, uh, we are just being patient uh, to let other community members join our meeting. It will be about one more minute and we'll get started. Thank you. Hola a todos los que se acaban de uh, unir a la reunión. Solo estamos esperando unos momentos más para que más personas puedan iniciar la sesión. Y, um, pero eso es todo. Solo vamos a esperar unos momentos más. Gracias. Okay, I think uh, we should get started. I see a few people still uh, joining us, but um, in respect to everyone's time, we'll get started here. Uh, the first thing we want to um, make sure you're aware of is that we have language interpretation available tonight on a second audio channel. We have um, Itzel is here from Community Language Cooperative to provide interpretation services tonight. So Itzel. Yes, thank you so much. Hola, muy buenas tardes a todos. Me llamo Itzel y estoy aquí para brindar servicios de interpretación. Los organizadores de este evento se han comprometido, comprometido a la justicia del lenguaje. Queremos que todas las personas presentes en esta reunión puedan escuchar y ser escuchados en el idioma de su corazón. En unos momentos va a poder ver un icono de un mundo, como aparece aquí en la pantalla, un icono de un mundo um, donde va a tener la, la opción de elegir entre inglés español, o español. Este es el idioma en el que va a escuchar la reunión y en el idioma que si participa es el idioma en el que va a poder participar. Y si es bilingüe, también puede elegir la opción off. Es muy importante de que todos puedan elegir un idioma para que yo, cuando yo cambie de canales, todos sigan escuchando fluida, en una manera fluida. Y si está usando su, la, la, una aplicación de Zoom en su teléfono para poder escuchar, la opción de interpretación le va a aparecer en la esquina de la derecha, um, en la parte a, a superior de su pantalla, y ahí va a poder elegir su idioma. Si en algún momento te, tiene alguna pregunta o preocupación, por favor avísenos en el chat y estamos felices de ayudarlos. Gracias. Hello everyone, my name is Itzel and I am here to provide interpretation services. Um, the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice. We want everyone present in this meeting to be able to listen in the language of their heart. And to do that, we will uh, uh, allow um, or we will be providing interp uh, simultaneous interpretation. Um, in just a few moments, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you click this icon, you will have the option of English, Spanish or off. It is important for everyone to choose a language just so that whenever I switch from channels, everyone can just continue listening in the language that they chose. And if you are fully bilingual, you can choose the option off. If you are listening on your, if you are viewing the meeting through a Zoom app on your phone, you will have these options at the top right corner of your screen, and you will be able to choose English, Spanish, or off from there. Uh, if you have any questions at any moment, please let us know in the chat. We will be happy to help you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Itzel. Appreciate it. 
Okay, so you are here uh, for the Northwest Community Transportation Network 60% Design Open House. We're glad to have you and, and glad you took the time to join us. Um, give Itzel a chance to get over. Uh, while we do that, I wanted to remind everybody, I know we've all been doing a lot of virtual meetings or, or most of us have, but some housekeeping items. So uh, it'd be great if everyone could remember to be muted to minimize distractions from background noise. If, um, if some people aren't muted, I'll try to remind you. I know it's easy to forget. Um, we really are using the chat window in this meeting to provide, in, in, like, to give uh, questions and to give us input. And what we're going to do is uh, we will answer questions that we receive in the chat. It's really important to use the chat because we will also answer all the questions you receive um, through a document we'll post online, even if we can't get them to, to them all this evening. We will have three question and answer sessions during this meeting. So we're gonna to try to break it up and give a chance for us to respond to some of your questions. Um, but yeah, that'll be the primary mode, it'll be chat. So thank you. With that, I want to introduce our project team. Um, so you'll be hearing tonight from, from a few folks. Um, the key people are our planning lead, who is Geneva Hooten, our engineering lead, Michael Koslow, our multimodal plan lead, Paige Colton, and myself. I'm the consultant project manager. My name is Chris Vogelsang, and I'm glad to be here. I do also want to recognize uh, Council District 1, uh, Councilwoman Sandoval and her staff for being involved in this process throughout and for participating in this meeting tonight. So thank you so much. With that, I wanna pass it over to Geneva Hooten uh, to get us started. Chris, and thanks so much everyone for joining us this evening. So we're here tonight to talk about the Northwest Community Transportation Network. This is one of three networks across the city. These are really intended as multimodal plans where we can hear about all transportation concerns and of course lead with the implementation of low stress bike projects to begin with. And if, if you're new to the project tonight, we will be talking about a number of corridors, all of which were envisioned 10 years ago in the Denver Moves Bikeways Plan, updated, updated again in 2015, and then part of the Blueprint Denver Plan in 2019. And we have lots of ambitious goals that we're trying to get to. The first is safety. As part of the city's Vision Zero Action Plan, it's our goal to eliminate all serious injuries and fatalities through transportation, um, by the year 2030, we want to prioritize multimodal projects to create a healthier and more sustainable and economically strong city, and particularly a really strong Northwest Denver. We want to rapidly deliver high comfort bikeways as part of the mayor's goal of delivering 125 new miles of bikeways by 2023. We want to help provide more ways for people to get around, maybe leave their car at home for a trip, and to help manage the volume of people that we have coming to the city and the traffic that does exist. And ultimately, we want to help people move in different ways. So this is what the bike network looks like as of today in Northwest Denver. And last year, we completed the West 50th Avenue bike lane between Tennyson and Lowell and installed West 35th Avenue neighborhood bikeway between Sheridan and Inca. And what we're aiming to do is to really build out a full network. And yeah, you can go to the next slide, thanks. And this is what our, our vision is and what we're working towards in terms of completing the network by the end of 2023. And so that's really creating these networks of north, south, east, west connections. So you can leave your home and safely get to where you want to go all across the city. And in terms of where we are in our process, we kicked this off right at the beginning of 2020. Of course, we've all been impacted by the pandemic and have been, um, thank you for all of your uh, flexibility in meeting us here online and, and trying to keep everyone as safe as we can. We This is now our fourth open house and we're here tonight with 60% designs and we're so excited to share them and get your input on these before we finalize designs and start Im implementing as soon as we can. Um, tonight is really our last big open house for a number of these corridors and we're going to be walking you through how you can go online and really view everything at a block by block level and provide us some detailed comments. And tonight we will be focusing on a few early install projects for 2021, uh, Byron Place, part of West 46 and North Zuni Street. We're also going to teach you how to provide input on those concept designs for those streets listed here on the screen. 
If you're joining by phone, that is West 23rd, West 41st, West 46th, Perry Street, Julian, Elliott, and Clay and Dunkeld. And then we're also going to provide some key updates on corridors that we know you're all really interested in, including Lowell and Tejon. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Michael Coslow. Thanks, Geneva. So when we talk about the projects going in, uh, the way that this is organized and uh, tonight is that we're going to talk about in the order that the plans are kind of developed and, and how, how close we are to getting them built. And as Geneva alluded to, we have three projects coming up here, very near future, spring and summer. Byron Place, a uh, neighborhood bikeway from Sheridan to Brain Street. The West 46, part of West 46th Avenue. Uh, the folks that uh, might have seen that it was resurfaced last year uh, between Federal and Lapan. And then uh, North Zuni Street, which is intended to be a resurface and we'll get into a little bit more detail. So first off, Byron Place, which is a, a neighborhood bikeway. Uh, this uh, project connects uh, between Sloan's Lake Park and into the Edgewater Commercial District. Um, it, it does provide us a, a good, a good um, neighborhood bikeway type connection, so a, a slower shared street, but also there's more on the next slide. Um, it is also a temporary recreational street. And by that, you may have seen those in other parts of Denver going up. Uh, there are streets intended to be shared bike and ped connections to help people be able to get out and enjoy the outside uh, during the uh, during these conditions that um, a little bit more socially distanced manner. Uh, the neighborhood bikeway and recreational street uh, is going to provide us the, that access to the Sun's Lake Park. And um, so right now, what you've seen there are the temporary barricades on Byron Place. Um, we're gonna remove those, introduce some traffic calming features and uh, which uh, would include kind of a, a bulb outs and um, uh, also, um, sorry, uh, bulb outs and uh, basically essentially things to slow down cars in between Sheridan and Vrain with that goal to reduce the volume of vehicles traveling on, on Byron and reduce the speed of them. And just kind of a shameless plug here that next week uh, with the Sloan's Lake Citizens Group, we are gonna have a stakeholder meeting to talk about it because the project is moving really quickly towards an implementation this spring. So the, the next project that we're focused on today is the West 46th Avenue. And as I kind of alluded to, it's kind of a two-part operation. Uh, West 46th Avenue, part of it, uh, Dottie has resurfaced last year between Federal and uh, Lapan. So you can see here uh, that that segment will be a bike, a bike lane project. There we go, bike lane project. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and uh, that will be installed very soon. We, we've just got, I'm very excited to say, we, we've got 100% uh, plans coming within the next week. Um, so folks that, uh, I appreciate that, you know, it's been a bit as we've been developing the plans, they're almost done and we will be installing us within uh, the spring summer timeframe. So uh, the, the next corridor I wanted to kind of key in, and, and this is kind of our first uh, open house uh, discussion of uh, North Zunai Street. Um, that is a project that also we have this opportunity through a repaving that we're doing this, this summer, uh, currently anticipated to start towards the end of June uh, from 46th Avenue to 52nd Avenue. And Zunai is also kind of a, a two, two for one in terms of the facility type. So, um, where we have a little bit heavier traffic, which we're going to get into. Actually, let me just first talk about wh what we're doing with, with Zunai. So it's gonna make those connections to the park. Uh, under It's that really good, uh, we have very few opportunities to get under I-70 and Zunai Street is one of them on a bike. Uh, so it does give you that connection to get under the highway towards um, into, into Adams County, into the, into the park and uh, connects to the Beach Court Elementary School. So getting into what is Zunai Street, um, so in, in order to determine what, what kind of what fits best for a facility, the first one of the things we do is uh, put out two counts, which I'm sure you've seen in, uh, around the uh, streets in Denver that kind of measure, you know, how fast are cars going over are them and how many cars are going over them. And uh, this is kind of the summary here. Um, we did those in uh, uh, very recently and I, well, I'd say within the last month. And in, as you can see here towards the south end, uh, Zunai has a little bit more traffic, the 3,400 
vehicles a day, and it's moving a little little quick, about uh, 30 miles an hour. Um, as we get a little bit further north, you can see it, it slows down, and that slows down a little bit going one direction, but primarily also the volume of traffic, right? Um, as, as folks are, are not using 50th or, or they're north of 50th, um, the volume of cars goes down a little bit more. And what that lends us towards is uh, a lens towards what facility fits for, for uh, that street. And so Zunai, uh, essentially between 50th and 52nd will be a neighborhood bikeway, uh, which is more uh, pedestrian focused. It, it gives us more uh, attention towards uh, access to the park. And also uh, one of the keys for a neighborhood bikeway is we want to have bikes riding on the same lane, the same space as, as vehicles. They're not in, in separate uh, bike lanes. Um, and so in order to do that, we want to mitigate the speeds of the cars driving in, on that part of Zunai. So the one disclaimer we want to put in, and, and I don't know how many folks think 500 trucks a day are going to be on North Zunai Street, but if they happen to be, then we're going to need to account for that in terms of our lane width. If they're not, it's very likely we're going to be able to provide that buffered bike lane on Zunai. So some of the input we received in talking about uh, uh, when we had a public input phase last year of uh, talking about uh, North Zunai Corridor includes that uh, cars are, there, there's the hill, right, uh, between 50th and 52nd, and, it, and that does pose what we call a sight distance challenge. That means it might be harder for a, a driver to see uh, a pedestrian or a bicyclist or someone in, um, on the road there, and also that, uh, as you can see the quotes here, it talks about uh, it, that we, we don't have a lot of north-south routes in uh, in Denver, that we're a little bit more challenged for those types of facilities. Uh, and so North Sunai would give us another one of those uh, avenues for folks going north and south. And uh, last but not least, um, yes, was basically the hill. And that the hill causes folks to drive a little bit quicker. Um, so when we look at, uh, a corridor, one of the other existing conditions that we like to, to check on uh, as a data point to be driven by data is the uh, available parking on the corridor. Um, as you can see here um, in the segment 46 to 48, 48 to 50th, we're, we're very, very open in terms of parking, very little parking utilization. Um, as we get closer to the park, closer to elementary school, we get uh, a little bit more utilization. However, in general, it's not too much throughout the corridor on North Zunai Street. So this is kind of a, a graphical depiction of that that, egg, that area on uh, North Zunai near the park. And what you can see here, the, the green, uh, these, are, these are maps where we've collected parking data. And what the green indicates is that uh, we are below 65%, we're well below 65% of parking utilization on the corridor. And that, that tells us that we don't need to do any sort of management like hourly parking or meters or anything like that. It's a, it's a neighborhood character and a street that is, is not very parked out on. So um, Zoo and I having a, a kind of a quicker timeline here than uh, the rest of the corridors, just kind of to share, I know this is a lot of information in one slide, but if you, if you go from the where we are here in April, we're, we're rapidly collecting the existing data um, we do have an open house just for the North Zunai Corridor coming on uh, May 11th. And folks that have, have signed up on the mailing list or on the corridor are going to receive invitations to that. It'll likely be a virtual meeting just like this one. Uh, after that, and we've gotten our, our uh, information locally to understand the character a little bit more, we'll, we'll do a walkthrough, we'll finish up the plans, and we'll be installing the uh, bike lanes and neighborhood bikeway facility uh, starting towards the end of June and into summer 2021. Um, as you all know, we have uh, sometimes weather, sometimes contractor availability, sometimes uh, equipment availability might impact that time frame. So that's why we can't tell you the exact day, but it's, it's around starting towards the end of June. Okay. And now- Super. Yeah, th thanks, Michael. Thanks for that. Um, that over again, this is Chris Vogel saying, and I'm kind of managing the meeting. Um, a couple of housekeeping pieces. I would love it if Itzel could post the um, instructions in the chat again, if you wish to join the Spanish language channel, that would be great. Um, and also to remind people that we're using the chat to ask questions. And I only saw a few, a few things coming in the chat, so we'll kind of deal with those now. But if you have questions, please use the chat and then we'll, we'll try to field your questions. So I think I'd like to start um, 
with a question, Michael, back to you. And it's really about neighborhood bikeways and what what speed are we aiming for to get cars to slow down to? Um, David David Kidder asked, are we shooting for 10 or 15 miles an hour more than that? Like what, what speed are we shooting for? Sure. Th thanks, Chris. Uh, oh, yeah, and, and a very good question because the speed absolutely impacts the safety when you're talking about uh, bikes and pedestrians in, in, the, in the road. Um, what we have right now, and, and I won't, won't get into to policy, but right now in Denver, uh, our uh, speed limit blanket speed limit right now is minimum 25. Um, we consider that kind of like a, a, a bottom, you know, if it gets to 25, that's, that's good. What's better is if we get to 20 and what's ideal and what we're really shooting for is to get those speeds down to 15 ideally. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, I think, um, we had a couple other questions here, and I think I'll pitch this one. Um, I would love it if Geneva could answer this, and I will uh, try to summarize here. It's basically is how do the 85th percentile speeds and volumes on Zunai um, qualify that piece of 50th to 52nd to be a neighborhood bikeway? I think what I'm understanding here is that when I saw that slide, the speeds were pretty high, and maybe give us a sense of you know, how we think that would work and what makes that um, come together? Good question. So between 50th and 52nd, the volume is at 1744 cars a day. So it's a little bit on the high range in terms of our, like the top range of a neighborhood bikeway where we would not have diversion, but there's enough things that we can do to, to make it so that there can be some soft diversion where perhaps if someone is driving, they say, ah, I'm good. I don't need to get up to 52nd on that street, I can go one over. And the speeds, it's, um, you know, 32 for southbound and 29 for northbound. Those speeds are much higher than we would want, but we see that as a really good opportunity to mitigate them. So that might look like curb extensions, that might look like some median crossings to help really um, add some friction mid-block, particularly because of the T intersection and that, that kind of um, road configuration. And the other thing to think about is because it's right next to a park, we really want to make sure that that particular stretch of Zuni is really pedestrian focused and it's helping people get there as best they can. So it's a, a number of different factors that we took in together to say, we think that there are enough things that we can do to mitigate this to make it kind of that shared street experience with enough safety benefits. Great, thank you, Geneva. Um, I wanted to, um, I, I know, I think we talked about this a little bit, but maybe Michael uh, Koslow, you give us a little more um, detail about what the installation process entails for these corridors. Like how does that happen? And um, is there notification and, and those sorts of things? Sure, thanks Chris. Yeah, when, when we are getting a little bit closer towards installation, uh, when I would say two to three weeks, sometimes, um, uh, we will be providing a flyer basically to inform folks that we're installing the projects. Uh, the actual install, sometimes you will see if a project's getting resurfaced, like North Zune Street, uh, two different flyers, one saying your road's going to be resurfaced, and then another one saying there's going to be a bike lane or, or bike facility added. So in general, that's, uh, that's what will happen, and then the actual process is different crews, right? And crews installing, or removing pavement markings, installing other pavement markings, and then a second crew that's going to be putting in the signs associated with the facility. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, I think um, I think we should we move on to the next section. There were a few comments I just wanted to reiterate. So Jonathan Patoko from from WeCan said they'd love to have us come talk to them about Byron. We're happy to do that. So Jonathan, just reach out to our team. We'll give you some contact info during this meeting. Um, and then the. Uh, I, th I think that was the main the main thing about uh, comments here. So let's let's move on to the next piece, and we'll have another. We have two more Q and A sessions here that we can kind of work work through together. So with that, uh, the first thing we really want to do before we get into the sixty percent designs, it's really important for folks to understand how to go see the actual designs. Um, we're going to show pieces and parts and kind of what's changed from concept, but we don't have enough time to go through each corridor block by block. And so we've provided those designs for you to provide detailed feedback for us um, out, on, out on the web. So 
Julia, I'm going to have Julia Walker from OV Consulting kind of run us through how to provide feedback and then give us a little demonstration of how that tool works. So, Julia. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we really wanted to make sure we had multiple different options in ways that you can engage um, during this time where we all need to be virtual. Um, so, we do have a project email and website. The email is Denver Moves at denvergov.org. And the website is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, uh, Denver Moves Network. And then you can, I, or if you prefer to call through our hotline, our phone number is 303-223-6575. Um, we also have the opportunity to use a new software called Conveyo, uh, where we have posted the concept designs and will be and you are able to share comments on it. So I am going to share my screen really quick. Okay, so you should be seeing my Google um, search engine. And so we'll just start from blank. You type in, to visit the uh, Conveyo site, you type in bit.ly, WNCTN comments. Uh, caps does not matter in this point. We have made sure it's accessible. And you'll be visiting our main page on Conveyo, which will host all the different concept designs for the quarters of interest, which and also will provide updates on uh, the paving projects, uh, updates on Lone Pejon and the Zunai project and the, the survey link, if you'd like to take the survey for Zunai. So I'll open up one of the concepts or the 60% designs. So I'll open up 23rd um, and you just press the red button and it takes you to the 23rd page, provides information on what is being proposed. And if you scroll down, uh, it shows the concept design. Um, and it does look a bit small on your page at first, but on the top of the concept or the 60% design, you can zoom into the corridors and see the notes of what is being proposed along each corridor. To scroll along the corridor, you can either do the drop down menu, viewing different aspects, or you can scroll down and press next to see the next part of the design. And you can also provide general comments if you'd like to ask any questions about the project in general or just the corridor overall. How to provide comments on concept design. Towards the top of each concept design, there is a button saying comment, and you click that. It should pop up with here, and I'll show you an example of a corridor where it's already received some comments. So if you can see on your screen, if you're joining by a computer, uh, the concept design I'm showing has a number of comments already. And so you're free to share your um, name. If you share your email, it's just for us to have so we can contact you afterward if you have any specific questions. Um, but it won't be shared to the public. And this is a really great tool it, for you to not only engage with the project team, but also engage with your community members. You can comment a suggestion or question and like and dislike anything people are writing and comment back, having a great conversation about what should be proposed. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and please let us know if you have any other questions. Yeah, really, just one more thing there. Um, I think uh, the other thing that we should cover real quickly. So to, when you um, click that comment button, and you got the little uh, circle. Could you show us what comes up when you go to actually make a comment? Yeah, so like, I was yeah, having perfect. a little bit trouble on my screen. Um, it's showing up for us, so. Oh, it is, the, okay, I was yeah, wondering. Click the, yeah, click the comment button, perfect. Okay, so when what it should look like, and I think is showing on your screen, when you click the comment button, what pops up is, um, an entry point where you can put your name and email so we can contact you afterward if you have any questions. And then so there should be any, a comment box. Yeah, Julia, click anywhere on the map. Now you'll see the 
Um, click, click the comment button again for me, please. There, and then as you can, so, yeah, yeah, just close that. Sorry. So I was, yeah, so my Perfect. screen's having a little bit of problems opening it, gotcha. but what should pop so, up? So yeah, if you just screen. sit still there, what happens if you hit the comment button is you'll see a little circle with a plus sign in it. Click on your driveway, click on the intersection of care. I think what Chris is referring to is uh, basically click on the location where you want to provide that comment in the in the conveyo site, and then you can provide the comment you'd like to uh, to share about. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's tied to the location and everything. So I think that was a great overview. We're happy to um, okay, provide any. I have a question for you. This is Councilman Amanda Sandoval. Hello. Hi. How are you all? Thank you for joining us. So. What about people who don't have access to internet? What about people who don't have access to be able to join us via Zoom? What about people who are work all day? Is there a phone number where they can call in and give comments? Because this seems super complicated. Um, even for me as an internet user, what about those people along the corridors that we are installing these. It's great that we have this internet access and we can zoom to what phone number can people call? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, um, Councilman Sandoval. Thank you for joining us. So this slide um, this, that I'm sharing right now shows the project hotline. So if you, yeah, if you are not, don't want to access it through the web or, or unable to, or it just doesn't work for you, we have um, several other ways for you to get in touch with us. and. Just you feel free to give us a call, uh, anyone at 303-223-6575, and, and we'll get back to you and have a conversation with you. We do get a, a quite a few um, calls, so just be a little patient with us if we don't get back to you in, in uh, the next hour or something. Sometimes it takes up to a couple of days for us to get back, but we will get back to you, and we have someone monitoring that, um, that hotline all the time. Thanks, Chris, because I was just going to ask, does somebody answer the call, or is best to leave a message and the time and date that they're available because oftentimes what I've found is people who don't have access to email I attempt to call them back when I've done other type of um, outreach I can't always get them during working hours is it best for them to leave specific times that they're available because oftentimes these numbers are called back nine to five and the people who are calling the number aren't available nine to five because they are working and they right. don't have access to internet. Is there people who are calling back on the weekends and in evenings? Yeah, thank you for that clarification. So yeah, the way it's set up, it is a voicemail hotline that we monitor. And the best thing to do is to leave a message with the issue that you're calling about the corridor with your contact information and a good time to call you. And we have called people back in the evenings or on weekends if that's the, um, the best time or the only time that works for them. And so we'll, we will make that work. Thank you for um, clarifying. Are there any other, uh, Councilwoman, any other points? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for, um, for adding to that. I think that really helps spell out to people exactly um, what's available to them. Okay, so let's move into uh, talking about the 60% designs themselves. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Michael Kozlo, uh, to take over again. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, as, as, we, as we look at the next projects moving forward, um, I'm, I'm actually going to pitch this back a little bit because um, we're going to talk about the facility types, right, of neighborhood bike lanes and bike lanes. And Geneva, I'm, I'm going to ask you to walk us through a little bit. What, what, what is a neighborhood bikeway compared? Yeah, thanks. So it sounds like many of you have joined us before. So this is going to sound, um, you're, you're, you're already experts in this one, but a neighborhood bikeway is a shared street with low volume and low speeds that prioritizes people who walk and bike. And the way that we accomplish that is by aiming to lower the speed as much as we can, knowing that speeds are the number one factor that um, predict the likelihood of a crash and the severity of the crash once that occurs. So that's by using things like speed humps, traffic circles, curb extensions, refuge islands. 
we really want to focus people at the intersections. So sometimes that means uh, rapid flash beacons when we're crossing, trying to help people cross across um, busier streets. Often that also means adding striped crosswalks. We want to reduce cut through traffic if the volumes on the street are really too high to still be within the threshold of a comfortable neighborhood bikeway. And then we want to increase visibility at intersections as much as we can, which sometimes means pulling the parking back just a little bit to increase that visibility. And one of the other things I want to talk about as it relates to neighborhood bikeways is the mid block treatments themselves. In the concept designs that we had developed and shared back in September, those concepts for Perry, Elliott, 41st, and Clay Street included a number of mid-block treatments, such as speed cushions, when the speeds were higher than we were targeting. However, there were lots and lots of uh, different mid-block treatments across the city, and knowing that these are, for the most part, new to the city and county of Denver and new to the department, we want to make sure that we're using them in really good ways and using them in ways that work for all of the different people who need to use our streets. So we're going to be piloting these and monitoring them across the city. So what you'll see in the designs is that speed cushions are kept on Perry Street between 20th and 27th. So that's right when you're coming from Sloan's Lake and moving north. And then we have chicanes and pinch points on Clay Street between 41st and 43rd. And we will go into those, what those look like. That's a new treatment for the city. So we will walk through that a little bit later in the slide deck. And some of you might be saying, well, but what does that mean for making sure that these are still really comfortable streets for people to bike on? And we, we recognize that that's a, a change from the concept designs. So what we've done is we went, we went back through and added more at almost every single intersection in those places where we had speed humps in the concepts. So you're going to see more at the intersection and instead um, some different innovative treatments, for instance, chicanes and pinch points elsewhere. So I'm going to then pitch it back to Michael and we're going to walk you through each of the corridors tonight and talk about what's changed and what you'll see in the con in the 60% designs. Hey Geneva, can I, so oftentimes we use words like speed cushions. What does that mean? Put, break that down. Like don't, like one of the things that I find frustrating with planning and, um, Dottie, we use terms like speed cushions. What does a speed cushion mean? Is it a speed bump? Is it, what's a speed cushion? Yeah, good question. It's effectively a speed hump or a speed bump. I think people can call them different things. In the image on this screen, you can see that there are divots in that. Um, so it's not one full thing. And the reason for that is that emergency vehicles can still pass through, their, their wheel wells pass through. And it also means that if you're on a bike, you don't hit that at a certain speed, you can actually kind of bypass that speed hump itself. So um, does that help a little bit, Amanda? Yeah, so it's basically, it's not a speed bump or the full length where, but it, it does stop vehicle speeding. Where exactly. it actually have the um, emergency vehicles go through and bikes go through easily, but it's it's designed to stop vehicles to go faster. Is that correct? That's exactly it. Awesome. All right. Great, thanks, thanks, Geneva. We're gonna pitch it back to Michael now, but first I did see some with their hand raised. I just wanna remind you that what we're trying to do is use the chat. Uh, I know that Councilwoman Sandoval, she's a special case and we really appreciate her helping um, the citizens understand what we're talking about, so thanks. Um, but it, Robert, if you ask your question in the chat, that would be that would be the best. So Michael. Thanks, Chris. So uh, as, as we start to dive into these corridors, we're basically going to talk about the, the east west corridors first and then the north south corridors. And the reason why uh, we're, we're talking about 46th Avenue first, and we're going to call this phase two of 46th Avenue. So in this phase, this is not the part of 46th Avenue that was recently resurfaced last year. Uh, it's a little further west from Tennyson to Federal. Uh, and then also you can see at the very east end, uh, we're going to make a connection to that Inca Street Trail to get towards downtown um, using 44th Avenue and LaPan Street. So it's kind of 46 plus a little bit extra at the end. Uh, and getting into the content of what's on West 46 Phase 2, 
Uh, basically, what we're looking at is a facility that is buffered bike lanes and bike lanes, um, and it's going to make those connections between the parks in, in uh, northwest Denver, Rocky Mountain Lake, or Berkeley Lake Park. Um, so uh, right now it also, as you know, uh, right now it's a little tough to get between uh, Edgewater and South Platte on a bike. This is going to provide that easier com uh, connection for a bike. Um, this is a similar theme on, on West 23rd Avenue, which is the next project. And I, I, I want to say for, for the sake of covering seven corridors in a short meeting, I'm going to be pretty quick. And I would want to suggest that um, we will have time to have input, detailed input, both through the website and through the phone. Um, folks that have questions, we will get to them. Uh, but I want to cover these pretty quickly. So 23rd Avenue, um, right now it, it starts out as a, a bike lane and it or, and it goes into a neighborhood bike way. Uh, the project is uh, basically from Sloan's Lake Park going east, uh, Perry Street. And uh, you can see the connection here. Uh, and it does connect with our neighborhood bike way on Perry Street. Hey, Michael, I have one question for you. Sure. If, if, if there's constituents on here who want to talk about where parking is removed, where can they find a map? Where can they easily find a map that talks about where parking's removed so that they can share it with their neighbor, neighbors? So parking will be removed along 23rd Avenue, parking will be removed along 46th Avenue. Where can we find that type of um, informational map? I know it was linked in the um, chat, but it wasn't the type of map that is specific to Northwest Denver. Is there a map that exists exists? Um, so not, I wouldn't say per se network wide, but if you get into the Conveo, the, the drawings that are, are um, linked and, and uploaded on the Conveo site, they do indicate where parking is proposed to be removed associated with the corridors. So what about if somebody doesn't have access to the internet, what did they do? Uh, I would recommend a call. Uh, for example, if someone says, I, hey, I've got parking out along a corridor, I, we've presented a corridor that there might be a concern that parking is going to be removed. Um, we, will, we will work with you because uh, we understand if parking is needed for uh, ADA purposes, if parking is needed, if it's being uh, loading for a business, um, we will work with you on those facilities. And that's what we really want to hear tonight and, and over, the, over the comment period before we're installing things, right? That it, rather than there being a conflict that we, we get those ironed out right now during the uh, design process. Does, does that make sense? It does. I was just looking for, the other day I was looking for, I got a comment about Zunai and I couldn't find just a map pertaining to the proposed um, infrastructure sites along the Northwest Denver area. And I like clicked and I spent like several hours searching and I contacted some from Dottie. So I would just like, I would just ask that if on um, the um, community network site, if we could just have a Northwest Denver proposed site where I could easily download it. And then when we get comments from people, I can send it to them because it's super complicated for me to send people. If, you, if I get it as a council person and someone's like, I'm getting a bike lane along 46th and Zunai that I proposed or 23rd and in Sloan's Lake. It's hard for me to send them to the sitemap to send them into like what you talked about. It would really be nice if I could just have a proposed bike lane map where I could send it off to constituents and I could download it myself and I could share via social media. Um, it's more um, nuanced when we have to go into each specific bike lane. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. That. And, so, yes. so I think I, what I'm hearing, so Councilman Sam, we have a lot of information to cover. I know you have good questions. Um, if we could kind of keep moving, I think it sounds like we should have a more detailed briefing with you um, to really understand what support you need to help, or we can provide to help you make sure the constituents and know asked, how we could how asked, we could do better. I've asked for that and it hasn't happened. So I'm going to use this time to continue to ask questions that I've received from my constituents because they can't talk. And it's my job to talk 
for them. And if we have to go over, I'm sure. I think hijacking a public forum is a good use of your constituents' right, we'll time. Okay, let's um, let's just let's take a step back here. I think what we want to do, um, if we can just go through. I know people are here to hear about certain corridors. Let's get through that, and then at the end, we do have a Q and A session at the end, and maybe we can open it up a little more at that time. That might be a, a good use of this time. I understand, Councilman Sandoval, where you're coming from, um, but I want to make sure that we get through this material. It's really important to to the Dottie team too. Michael. Oh. Yeah. So, so getting back to, to 23rd Avenue, so in the, in the neighborhood bikeway, I guess let's talk about what, what we, what's changed in some of the key features here. Um, it, it starts as a neighborhood bikeway, transitions into bike lanes. As we approach a little bit closer towards federal, um, there's another project that will pick it up to get uh, uh, bike lanes into downtown. Uh, but what's changed since last uh, September is we've added a traffic circle at, at Raleigh Street. You can see an example of what, what it might look like. Uh, in the graphic, and the travel lanes are now narrowed to 10 feet um, in coordination with our city traffic engineers' determination of, uh, hey, uh, we, we want to we maximize space for the bike lanes um, and visually narrow that road so that folks are driving a little bit slower. And then last but not least, uh, that uh, we provide a buffer for that eastbound travel from Clarkson to Lowell. So the next project we wanted to talk about quickly is 41st Avenue, which is also a neighborhood bikeway. Um, it's also on, it's, it's actually also on a, a easier to traverse with a bike street, but what we want to do is make it even easier through converting this to a neighborhood bikeway. And it goes from Perry also to Inca to the Inca Street Trail. And the, some of the features that, that will be included, and you can see the kind of the graphic here at, at Pico Street, um, we were, intending to include, and there will see seven traffic circles on West 41st Avenue, 15 intersections with curb extensions. So it would be painted and uh, posts, as you can kind of see on the left side with the post depicted there, the flex post to shorten that crossing for a pedestrian trying to get across 41st Avenue or the cross street. And uh, traffic calming near the three schools indicated there. And uh, bike detection will be added at Federal. A lot of times bike detection is, um, key, you know, right, if you're riding on a bike and then you, you get there and, and you want to have to otherwise uh, hit a button or, or wait for a signal, um, that's that's one of the goals is uh, when we get to a busy street like a federal, that we provide you that access to get across that street. Uh, so also the refuge islands in the of bottom here, and this is an, uh, an example here. So the Perry Street and at Pecos of, of how pedestrians will be able to ease, more easily get across at Pecos um, and 41st. So uh, yeah, this is, this is essentially a similar thing, but what, what has changed um, is that we've added the curb extensions since last year um, when we introduced the concept of 41st Avenue. We've had seven traffic circles added to the corridor. They also helped to reduce the speed and the speed cushions were removed. So kind of get into that a little bit of the pilot program, what that is and, and what Geneva kind of alluded to is we are wanting to make sure our emergency services responders, our partners doing street maintenance, doing plowing the street, et cetera, are able to also provide, uh, are able to maintain that service uh, that they need to provide you. And in order to do that, we're not gonna introduce these all over the place, but introduce them in specific corridors and monitor those to see what's, what's happening before we proliferate them across town. So uh, Perry Street, uh, neighborhood bikeway uh, is the next corridor. And Perry Street, also a neighborhood bikeway, and it's one of those elusive north-south facilities to get us north and south through Denver. Um, so essentially, Sloan's Lake Park up to 46th Avenue, where, where the new bike lanes are going to be installed there. Uh, that is the next project. And some of the key features, uh, as we kind of alluded to earlier, uh, the, the speed humps will, will are being proposed in order to calm traffic, slow, slow down traffic at, at six locations. So every block between 20th and 27th Avenue. Uh, we also recognize uh, folks that are crossing 29th Avenue. If you're on Perry Street trying to ride across 29th, we'll be riding a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. You can kind of see a picture of that there. And what will be unique about these, um, you've probably seen them throughout Denver, but neighborhood bikeway facilities will also include a, a push button. So if you're riding up on a bike, you get to the curb, you push the button there to activate the uh, 
directing the rapid flashing beacons, which essentially are a warning to drivers if there's someone trying to cross, uh, and uh, also multiple curve extensions. So what has changed, um, we have included the traffic, well, we added the traffic circle at 37, we added curve extensions, at, and you can see five locations there, Hayward 33rd, 42nd, and 43rd, and we've, uh, the raised crosswalk, uh, we didn't have an ADA ramp there uh, between Ed at Edison Elementary, so we didn't think it was a good idea to put that raised crosswalk because we need to have that facility to meet the needs of everyone being able to get across Perry Street there. And last but not least, uh, there, because there's a hill that is one of the uh, pilot uh, requirements for the mid-block uh, speed uh, traffic calming program. And because of that hill, we did not include that speed push north or the speed cushions of 27 that one. So the next corridor we were looking to talk through with you all tonight is uh, North Julian Street. Uh, North Julian is a, a pivot from North Irving. Uh, we heard you um, with regards to North Irving and um, we've made a pivot to North Julian and recognizing that we can get that connection on a bike a little bit easier without the conflicts associated with North Irving. And so that project is from Sloan's Lake also up to 35th Avenue, the neighborhood bike way there. And so what you'll see on um, Julian, probably the key to North Julian is uh, getting across there at 26 where it jogs. And how, how are we going to do that? It's kind of a, a unique treatment in Denver, which is to provide uh, a, a median, a short median uh, running bike lane that's protected in between the travel lanes on 26th Avenue. So if someone were riding south, it's kind of indicated with the arrow there, that there'd be a, a sheriff that says, hey, um, you could turn and want to keep going south on the Julian Street project and uh, right a short amount on 26th Avenue, but protected from the traffic and then it return at the uh, east end, which is another picture. Uh, the, the other features we include on North Julian are six traffic circles, uh, three medium refuge islands there, 23rd, 29th, 32nd, Curb extensions at 17, uh, the always stop, or curb extensions at 18th Avenue, pardon me, and an always stop at 17th Avenue, which is also separately, we're looking at you know, our, our bike lanes there. Uh, and then additional crosswalks throughout the corridor. Uh, the next project we wanted to cover is the North Elliott Street neighborhood bikeway, and that is from 20th Avenue to 29th. Uh, it, it provides a connection just kind of parallels federal, but not along federal on a street that's a lot not as busy as federal. Um, and so from 20th Avenue to 29th Avenue, as you can see here. And some of the, the key features, uh, we also were going to be including traffic circles on North Elliott Street, 22nd Avenue, and at 28th Avenue. And then the curb extensions on every block on North Elliott from 22nd to 28th. Uh, bike detection at the signal at Elliott and 26th Avenue and buffered bike lanes from 26 to 27. So that is where we have additional traffic relative to the grocery store there. So uh, that's, it's gonna be a buffered bike lane there to provide a little more protection on that block. Um, this, and uh, last but not least, um, as we get closer towards uh, Viking Park and uh, the high school, we are providing this connection with, uh, that I kind of alluded to before, similar to the other corridor that uh, Rectangle Rapid Flashing Beacon um, which is a, a lighted sign, it's an active crossing warning that says if a bike hit, hits that um, uh, detect the button, there it will go off and there will be a, a warning lights going off for um, traffic on 29th Avenue. So uh, what's changed compared with uh, when we introduced the concept of Elliott last year, uh, we added the, the flashing beacon across the 29th Avenue. Um, we have added the curved extensions at, at 24th and we're working on it on the 27th. It will be into the design. Uh, the flex posts uh, are removed from curb extensions because we have those turning movements. We want to make sure we'll be able to actually accommodate turning movements and not lose those flex posts immediately. So we've looked, taken a hard look at the turning radii and decided it, it, it wouldn't work to put them at those 22nd, 28th. And similar to what we allu I alluded to on uh, 41st, the speed cushions were removed due to the pilot program, which is essentially saying. We're going to put them on a corridor um, within Community Network Northwest that has the most need for, for uh, speed mitigation, which is very soon. So the next corridor we want to talk about is the Clay and Dunkeld neighborhood bikeway 
in shared use path. So Clay and Dunk Health gets from 46th Avenue going north to south uh, towards uh, 29th Avenue and at third. So basically from 46th to 29th is like Clay Street. Uh, we recognize as you get from 32nd down um, towards Zunai, we'll be using Dunkeld, the shared use path along Dunkeld, and I'll get into that a little bit. So uh, the Clay Street project uh, does have the traffic circles and curb extensions. Um, and at 38th Avenue, where we have that really busy crossing there, um, that we were introduced bike detection uh, for bikes and the pedestrian crossing refuge at Clay and 39th. Uh, so we will be, I guess more, but so the diverter at Clay, yes. So let's get into that a little bit. So we have a few of those diverters and what those do is if we have too many vehicles on a corridor that we wanna share with bikes and vehicles, uh, a diverter presents an opportunity to reduce traffic on those streets and re-divert it, as it says, to other corridors. Uh, we also consider those to be kind of a neighborhood connector. So if you're walking and you're trying to get across uh, 35th, um, it's, it's a little bit easier because you don't have as much uh, traffic to conflict with. Um, and at the same time, while we're doing that, um, it does uh, maintain that, like it's kind of alluding to the bike and pedestrian access uh, it will be maintained for both of those corridors, 35th and Clay. Uh, the other features that I wanted to, to key in uh, Geneva has alluded to earlier is um, our mid-block traffic calming features. These are kind of new to Denver. You might, you might have seen them in other locations or around Colorado. Um, on Clay Street, we are in introducing what's called a pinch point um, between 41st and 42nd. And what that is, uh, maybe if you've all been on a very narrow street where uh, you have to slow down for the next car coming, this is the goal of the pinch point to do that, to compel drivers to slow down while they're all in between these longer blocks. Uh, the other And 42nd and 43rd, uh, another feature similar is, is the chicane. So uh, we're not talking like a huge veer, but what it is, is it's going to compel a, a car to slow down a little bit in order to traverse that. They're going to be seeing uh, the means to have to traverse clay would be to have to slow down a little bit um, to, to, make those, uh, to make that connection. And that slows that down. So if you're on a bike, it's a little bit easier to ride um, and you don't have as many conflicts with the cars. Uh, so getting into the southern segment, which is uh, Dunkel Place, uh, that is a shared use path. As you know, right now there's an existing shared use path along Dunkel. We get into uh, Valdez Elementary School and Denver North High School property there um, right at the parking lot. Right now there's no physical barricade, but we want to work with Denver Public Schools to make sure that the facility going through the school is in coordination with the schools and endorsed by the schools. It's something that they're agreeing with. So formally that becomes an easement agreement. And what that means, this is the reason why there's clay and Dunkeld and not clay Dunkeld, is that um, it might take a little bit longer to get that agreement in place. So uh, while we're working on that, um, we'll be able to um, get clay installed here a little bit sooner than, than Dunkeld. Dunkeld perhaps going as, as Jim had alluded to earlier, as, as late as 2023, while we, it's, it's a formal real estate agreement. So it takes a little bit of time. Yeah, great, Michael. So um, that was a lot of information to go through. I know it was it was uh, quick. Um, we just have a lot of corridors uh, going on. <clears throat> I think what I'd like to do, I've seen a lot of uh, comments coming in the chat, and I'd like to um, group a couple together. Excuse me. So I saw a lot of theme about the speed cushions, uh, the speed humps, and maybe uh, Geneva, if you could give us a little better um, start at you know, what is the city's policy with those mid-block treatments and how will that pilot work? And I think there was a lot of concern about why are they being removed? They were pretty important to um, to those corridors, the neighborhood bikeway corridors. So when we took a look at all three of the networks together and all of the different mid-block uh, speed mitigation elements like speed humps or speed cushions, however you want to call them, those, um, when we took them all together, we had a huge list across the city. And in order to look at where the pilot locations really could have the most impact and where, so where speeds were the highest, if the grade, so how steep that street is, wasn't too high, 
We also looked at, are any of these corridors going to be repaved in the time of 2021, two, three, in which case then it wouldn't be a good pilot. We wanted to make sure that we had really good pre-data of what those feeds look like before um, in order to be able to collect it after. So there was a lot of different look um, and analysis that went into choosing those locations. And I think one of the really good things about the Perry location is that it is a sequence of them. So we'll be able to see, we have, we have the, the four speeds, and we'll, we'll be able to see for that six blocks, seven blocks between 20th and 27th, how that really is mitigating speeds and potentially in, increasing comfort for people biking. Um, and in terms of kind of what that means moving forward, there's still a lot of work to be done, um, and we will continue to communicate with you all about what that looks like and, and if these things kind of become part of our standard practice moving forward. Yeah, great. Thanks, Geneva. Um, I think the uh, the next thing I'd like to, to ask is really related to maintenance. So there were some, some chat questions about how will neighborhood bikeways be maintained? How will bike lanes be maintained? Some of that was related to, um, geez, if we can't get speed cushions, can we at least make sure these neighborhood bikeways get plowed so we can get to work? Um, can um, I'm not sure who the best is for that. I don't know if it's Geneva or Michael, but um, you guys can flip a coin and jump in. Thanks, Craig. I, I, I could take it. Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, how, how are they maintained? As we all had the uh, experience, our, our fun snowstorm uh, recently, uh, when was that? Uh, about a month back. Um, what Dottie will, will do is maintain one plowed path through those corridors on the neighborhood bikeways through what's called the, the residential uh, snow plow program. And that program, we only deploy it when we're in really um, Basically, we know there's snow falling, and I don't want to say exactly the amount because it depends on how much, right? It's the weather. Uh, but when we have a high inundation snowfall event where we think that the snow is going to be there a long time, then we will be maintaining those facilities. Um, I, I don't want to speak for that program because it's through street maintenance's program, but I can say what, that when Dottie and the city has to undertake that, it's a very expensive process. It's about a million dollars every day. So we want to make sure that we're really uh, judicious for when we're going to be doing that work. But at the same time, we want to be able to have people to get, get around, right? If you're in a snowstorm and you need to get out, you need to get to food, you need to get to the hospital, we need to be able to provide that for you. So that's kind of, in summary, that's that's the, the current residential snow. Um, and we can follow up our crews in uh, design. Don't, don't run that. It's within street maintenance. Uh, but if you provide us a, a question, we'll, we'll get you to those folks that do that specifically for a specific order. Hey, Greg, quick, quick follow-up. Um, so will, um, will, will Dottie be working with street maintenance in terms of setting prioritization of like, you know, do neighborhood bikeways get plowed over other streets? Maybe you, you sort of alluded to that, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as facilities are being installed, uh, we are in coordination every week with the street maintenance division about the schedules because I obviously uh, they, basically the street maintenance division they, they make the basement they, they provide us the um, the layer of, of smooth pavement to ride a, a, a bike or ride you know, a car or drive or walk on and we provide the the roof the the uh, pavement markings and the signs and the traffic signals that you see above the ground and so we do have to be in coordination with them very frequently in terms of those uh, facilities, we also, uh, we haven't gotten to a, a protected bike lane description yet in Northwest, uh, but when we do have those, we wanna be able to maintain those just like we do in uh, like downtown, like on a 15th Street, Lawrence, Rappaho. So um, as, as there's more facilities, there's the need for more maintenance of those facilities. And so we'll have a, a coordination on that. That's obviously not, not a project to project, but more of a, hey, um, we have this many new uh, of protected bike lane facilities coming in this year, and we're going to need uh, that much amount of maintenance to maintain them. Not not this one project has this, and so we better get a pile for that. Uh, it's for the whole city, for the whole network. Great. Thanks, Michael. So I, now I'm going to go from um, kind of a high-level program level down to a couple of really specific design-related questions. And Michael, this is probably to you. So um, uh, a question about RRFBs, the rapid rectangular flash flashing beacons. Do those, de are, is it intended that those would detect pedestrians and bicyclists as they come up or is there a push button that people need to push to activate that device? 
It, it is a push button, kind of like you would see it at a lot of traffic signals uh, that are not pre-timed. So uh, I, I can signal at, uh, uh, I can name one off the top of my head, but basically I'm sure you've all walked up to a traffic signal and seen a push button. That, that is the goal. Um, if there is the need for an uh, audible push button that can be heard for, for someone who is visually impaired, we would like to hear that. We would like to hear that from, from you, from folks that are, um, would be needing that. If that's the case, then we will provide that audible push button so it's a little bit easier to hear. And then there'd be a detection, uh, a sound detection if someone would want to walk across or bike across the street. Great, thanks, Michael. And I, I think um, one more question at this at this juncture, and then we'll move on. There were um, a couple questions about the center protected bike lane on 26 that we showed on the Julian corridor, but how that would work, and um, some comments about how kids might be using it to get to to the elementary school. And so, Michael, I thought maybe um, you might be best to kind of start with that, and if there's other people to call on, and I'll go back to that slide. Okay, so. Thanks, Chris. Go ahead, and yeah. I'll, and, uh, I'll move back. Okay. Yeah, as, as, as Chris is going to spin back to that uh, slide in particular, it, it's, it's kind of like we have a, a great corridor except for this one jog, right, at 26th Avenue. And what, what we're doing is uh, providing an all ages and abilities connection, which means the reason for the median um, is we can have uh, only one conflict at a time, right? So if you're riding a bike, um, you're going southbound, you're approaching those westbound lanes, you have to navigate one set of traffic on 26th Avenue, then you're in a protected mode while you're, you're getting along that offset and until you have to navigate the, the eastbound vehicles to go further south on Julian. Um, if there's, there are uh, more, more uh, junior uh, riders, which we're really excited to be able to share that, that we'll be able to have a facility, there's nothing to stop someone to say, you know, hey, what you can do is get off your bike, walk over the sidewalk, walk across 26th Avenue, walk along the sidewalk to 26th Avenue, hop back on the bike and, and, and ride further down on Julian Street as someone would do today. There's nothing that would stop someone from being able to do that. You can completely understand if someone would want, want to navigate that crossing differently. Um, that, and that's, that's another opportunity, for, another way to get across. But for folks that are riding and maybe they, they want to keep moving, um, this is a, a this is the facility we um, are envisioning to be able to do that. Can I ask one? Um, you you may not have the answer, uh, Michael, right now, but um, so in this 26th, the picture we're showing here. So if you were going west on 26th and then you to go north on Julian, uh, is the bike intended to yield to the vehicle, or are the vehicles going to have yield lines to the bike? That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, yes, it, it, it is. It is the unfortunately the latter. The bike will be needing to yield to the vehicle at that location. Uh, it, gotcha. It's a little bit unusual. Uh, the state law is if it's a pedestrian is in the road, you're supposed to yield. Well, we all know sometimes that can be challenging. So I, I, I would say at this point for bikes, because bikes are considered to be vehicles, they would need to be yielding legally. They would need to be yielding to the other travel uh, cars. Okay, I know there were a, a few comments and concerns about that. I think that's a place that we'll need to pay some special attention on. If you do have specific comments about that that we didn't address, please go to that conveyo and um, put them in or call us. And I'll give you that information again at the end of this. So let me go back to, um, to where we were. One moment. Okay. I'll jump in really quickly, Chris, while you're opening that. And um, sure, there is a lot going on in the chat right now. And I, I just want to remind everyone to please be as respectful as possible. This is a, a community meeting. We're all here together, pretend that we're in person and, and saying these things face to face. So please, please, please maintain as much respect as you can. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great point, Janine. I can't, I, I would have said that. I can't see the chat live. I see the questions. So um, yeah, just, you know, we can all disagree and have a civil discussion, but um, let's let's use our uh, our civility and try to try to do that. So, okay, so now um, we're going to talk about project updates for some other corridors that we haven't discussed yet and sort of next steps. And I'm going to pass it over to Paige Colton to talk about um, Lowell and Tejon. Everybody, thanks for um, sticking in here. I know there's a lot of content. Um, and information to share. So appreciate you listening to all this. So I'm gonna give you a brief update about North Lowell Boulevard and then North Tejon Street 
Um, and we'll be discussing this at a later date um, this summer. So um, definitely ask any questions you have now, but we don't necessarily have full answers for you. Um, so North Boulevard, uh, sorry, North Lowell Boulevard between 46th Ave and 52nd Ave. Um, we showed you a two-way protected bike lane on the west side in the fall as a concept design, um, which we're really excited about because it's kind of unusual for us to do in Denver. Um, unfortunately, after additional analysis and some engineering um, evaluation, we realized it doesn't meet our city standards because of the traffic signal needs. And to, to put that more plainly, um, the traffic signal at 46th Ave and 50th Ave are both um, span wire, essentially really old traffic signals. And for a two-way protected bike lane to work on one side, we need to have bike signals as well installed at those signals. We cannot do that with an old signal like this at 46th and 50th. So next question we asked as well, can we upgrade these signals? And the answer again was, unfortunately, we have a huge list of signals that need to be upgraded in the city for many different reasons. Um, and we, these are just not on the priority list in the near future. So we're kind of going back to the drawing board. It's okay that some of these are iterative, more iterative process than the others. We're moving forward with some, some are going to take a little bit longer. Um, that's sometimes the way process works. So we are going to evaluate alternative designs to provide a high comfort bikeway between 46th and 52nd in the area. Um, you know, we definitely have to cross I-70 at on Lowell. That's kind of our only option. Um, moving farther north, um, it may be that we look at a different design on Lowell itself. We may um, jump over to Mead Street, which is the corridor just adjacent to Lowell to see if that might work better or differently. Um, so right now we're just kind of in an evaluation stage. Um, we're definitely gonna continue to work with all the stakeholders we've worked with in the past, business owners, residents, Regis, Brun, uh, to make sure that we're you know, incorporating everyone's feedback as we do this analysis. Okay, so that's the update on Lowell. That update on the North Tejon Street project from 32nd Ave, 45th Ave. So in the fall, we showed you a protected bike lane as a conceptual design um, that would remove parking from both sides of the street. We heard a lot from the public, um, from you all. Um, we now better understand the substantial business parking and loading needs um, along the corridor. And we also understand that bicyclists really need a safe and comfortable north-south connection in this area. So what does that mean? Again, it's kind of an iterative process. We're going to do some more evaluation to see what, what we can come up with. Um, we are going to evaluate possibly alternative designs on Tejon or an alternative alignment or and or an alternate alignment. Um, so North Shoshone and Kiva Street are just adjacent to Tejon. Um, you can kind of see on this map the, the various north-south lines here um, shows Shoshone and Kivas right next to Tejon. Um, these have the potential to be uh, great neighborhood bikeways. Um, Shoshone in particular actually connects to two different schools, which is really exciting. Um, we'd like to provide a high comfort bikeway in this area. Um, Shoshone or Kivas could be the way to do it. We still need to collect volumes and speeds. We need to really evaluate um, the intersection at West 38th Ave. That's um, West 38th is a big street. It's hard to cross. Got to figure that out if, if we wanted to make one of these alternatives work. So again, we're in the evaluation stage. Again, we're gonna to continue to work with stakeholders and you all the public on these. So next slide, okay. So currently we're collecting additional data and conducting engineering analyses of these alternate designs and or corridors. 
This summer, we're going to engage with stakeholders and you all, the public. Um, again, iterative process, we're, we're coming back to you. We're gonna to talk to you again, hoping to wrap up designs later this year. And then as early as 2022, we would have project insulate, we would install these projects. Um, we don't have, you know, an exact timeline. I think all of our community networks, Central, South Central, have some projects that are lagging behind the others. That's totally okay. It doesn't mean they're not gonna get funding. It just means kind of on a different timeline. Hey, can I interrupt Paige real quick? So thank you for this. I don't think it's iterative. I think a lot of the people who you reached out to in March of last year on this corridor were dealing with COVID. So we just have to identify that. Like we all have to talk about the fact, I just wanna say publicly, I had a cousin die last year, just last week, last Thursday of COVID. She was 70, she could have got the vaccine and she didn't. And now I have to go to a funeral for my cousin who has COVID. So I don't want to diminish the outreach that you all did, but I do want to talk about the fact that unlike any other time in our world history, unlike the 1918 Spanish flu, when we didn't have this conversation via social, like Zoom, we have not had a pandemic of this size. So I don't want you to say iterative, please. I want you to say continued outreach because these, I read a newspaper article that said 25% of our small businesses will not show up anymore due to COVID. That's because we lost people who we love. And we, this is like a serious time in our, in our we will never, all of us on this phone call will always remember 2020 as the time of a pandemic, not of a 2020 time of a bike lane. And we will have lost 25% of our small businesses. So can you please acknowledge that? Can you please acknowledge that some of our small businesses along Tijon did not respond to something because we reached out to them in April and they were shut down. Our mayor, made the executive decision to shut down businesses during COVID. And if anyone wants to ridicule me on public comment on that in this feed, go ahead. Because I'm telling you, I have to go to a funeral next week for a loved one who just died of COVID. And it's real and it still exists. So can we please use different terminology to talk about our outreach in 2020 compared to what's going on right now? Because COVID is real. And I need you all to acknowledge that, please. And I don't want this to be us versus them, the bike community who's probably going to ridicule me in public comment right now for those who may not have lost a loved one to COVID or lost their job or lost their ability to make income. We have had a worldwide pandemic. So please say, state that page moving forward. That's what I ask of this. And I ask of everybody moving forward. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks Councilwoman Sandoval. Thanks for that heartfelt um, comment. And we will truly try to take that to heart. I know that we're in about 10 minutes left in our meeting and I know that um, we just have, I think one slide left and then I wanna get back to some, there were some pretty important questions I wanna to get to. So if we can just um, uh, please in the chat, don't uh, ridicule that and be polite and that would be great. So um, I think I'm gonna have Michael Coslow talk about the implementation timeline. And then I believe we're gonna take um, a few questions and close out, so Michael. Thanks, Chris, and and well understood. We are we are under crazy times here, and we are all experiencing things that uh, we, we that affect how we communicate with each other, and sometimes it, that affects uh, our small businesses, our communities. And I, I I'll I'll just kind of pivot from that to say, um, as we're moving down the line of, of providing these facilities, um, what we will be doing is 
combining all of our projects. It's kind of like you want you want to build a house. You go you go to Home Depot and you buy all this stuff. So right now we're we're out and we're we're picking up the the, the, the hammer and the tools and and everything that we need to build all these facilities. Um, these projects that we've identified on sixty percent: Perry, Julian, Elliot, Clay, Dunkeld. If our agreement gets in place with the school, Twenty Third Avenue, Forty First Avenue, Forty Sixth from Tennyson to Federal will become packaged into one uh, work order that will be included with other projects in the South Central and Central Community Networks. So when you see this wide range of when will it get built of fall 2021 to summer 22, uh, what happens is we, we put all those in together uh, with the other corridors and the other networks. Uh, our contractor provides us a, a schedule that might make more sense, maybe if they have a lot of facilities that have the same type of thing um, like, uh, you know, say 12 of the projects have flex post, they'll, they'll have 12 projects put together. So that's why we are looking at um, a, a wide range of installation of time frame. But that, that is the goal when we get done here. We'll, we'll, when we get out of Home Depot and we have all the materials, we're going to send it out to the community through a public bid. And um, then they will be installed uh, along with the corridors from Central and South Central. And that's hopefully the, the good news. Okay, great. I want to hear from you in the meantime. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Michael. So um, this is our, our third Q&A session. We have about five minutes. And one, there were some kind of specific questions that I want to pitch to the team. I think Geneva, I'd like to have you answer. And it probably sort of applies to the program as a whole, but specifically 41st, um, why those limits weren't extended further east. and you know, why couldn't we do that? It seems to it make sense to the community and what are our limitations? Yeah, it's a really good question. And that segment of 41st between Sheridan and Perry is on the Denver Moves bike network. So it's, it's intended to be a neighborhood bikeway. It just wasn't funded as part of this whole package. The rest of 41st Avenue was part of the bond that was passed in 2017. So that is bond funded. Um, and I also kind of saw a few things in the chat saying, well, what about 26th or what about 29th? We hear you. We know that those streets definitely need some work um, from, a, from all modes perspective. Uh, those just weren't funded in this kind of tranche of projects that we've been working on. So um, we hear you, but not for tonight. Great. Yeah, it's sort of like step by, uh, step, by step. Thank you for that explanation. Um, Michael Coslow? Um, more of a detailed question about diverters, um, specifically about the diverter at 32nd and Clay. So uh, how, how did diverters work? I mean, can you drive straight across that diverter? Or do you, are you forced to turn right? Like what are the vehicle movements? And then how do the bikes interact with that? Can they go straight across? I think that was kind of the gist of the question and PEDS. Thanks, Chris. And it, 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 you essentially got it that uh, if you are a driver on Clay, you get to 32nd going south or north, um, it will be a, a compulsory turn to turn, um, which will uh, divert that vehicle traffic, right? Um, keep the traffic uh, lower on, on Clay at that interface at 32nd. Um, however, uh, a bike or pedestrian, as um, you might have seen at uh, 35th and uh, Irving, uh, we have uh, a diverter there now. Uh, the bikes and pedestrians can get across. And that's why um, I'm putting my shameless pitch in to be a neighborhood connector rather than a diverter, right? Because you can still walk across the neighborhood or bike across the neighborhood. So that's essentially how that was, those will function. Great, Thank my, thanks, Michael. Yep. Um, so the real intent is to divert vehicular traffic, auto traffic, and make the streets less busy and make them safer. Uh, Paige Colton, I, I have a question to come your way about Lowell, and um, there there was a couple of questions in the chat about when will that crosswalk um, across Lowell at 48th be installed? And now that sort of we're moving at a slightly different timeline than the 60% designs, maybe you can give a little framework about how things might move forward with with that corridor and those items. Yeah, definitely. So I I know that. Um, 48th North and South are both corridors of concern for the community for good reason. You know, it's really hard to cross as someone walking, they're hard to cross, um, certainly someone biking, even driving, it's difficult to navigate those on and off ramps. Um, and then across Lowell as well. Um, so getting to Rocky Mountain um, 
like park. Um, so I think the timing, we're kind of still working on how our bikeway designs will interact with that ped crossing. Um, so it'll probably line up with um, the bikeway installation um, in terms of that crossing. If you're asking about the crossing on Lowell Boulevard itself at 48th South. Yeah, I think that's exactly what they're asking about. Yeah. Okay, so we line up basically I know that's an urgent community uh, desire that's been talked about a lot through our planning process. Yeah. It's on our, our list, um, but that complication with in the Lowell facility and having to rethink that is sort of interfering with uh, getting that done like right away. So we'll, we'll kind of circle back on that as a team. I think I have, um, I I have uh, one more uh, that I wanted to just, just acknowledge. So I know uh, Leslie Toragowski had wanted to see this, the 23rd and federal intersection again. And Leslie, you left your um, email in our chat, which is great. We'll have somebody from the team just send you a direct link so you can go and, and see that and grab it uh, if that, that works for you. Um, other than that, I think we should go um, kind of wrap up. We will circle back on all the questions you received, answer them in that document and, and provide that out. Great, so this is our, our last slide of the evening and it's just as a reminder um, about how you can get in touch with us and how you can uh, talk to us about these corridors and your specific questions and comments, uh, anything we didn't answer tonight. So if you do have uh, internet access and our web uh, knowledgeable, the best way is to go to that bit.ly, bit.ly slash nwctn comment. That'll take you to that site that Julia showed us and you can see the designs in detail and provide really specific comments about things. Um, the, probably if you're not that internet savvy or that just doesn't work for you or it doesn't work for your schedule or, or time, feel free to give us a call at 303-223-6575. Leave a voicemail for us and tell us what you're calling about and a, a good time to get back to you and we'll do that. Um, if it's not convenient from the nine to five, Monday through Friday, we'll make that work. So um, we really want to want to engage with you and, and hear that. There's also a, um, a way you can sign up uh, to have like a small group discussion if that's useful too. So we call those office hours and that's shown down there. Um, we can sign up at our website and the website is um, a little different than the comment website. So it's bit.ly slash Denver Moves Network. You go there, there'll be a link um, and you can just sign up for office hours or you can leave on a, a call, sign up voicemail and say, hey, I want to sign up for office hours. We'll get back to you. Um, always, as always, you can also send us an email too. So I think with that, I want to really thank everybody for their time. Um, I know there's a lot of information there and um, want to acknowledge that it has been challenging over the last year, year, well, year and something here. I um, wish we could meet in person, wish we could talk face to face. That's just kind of how it is right now. Um, but yeah, we want to be available by phone, email, whatever is best for you. Um, so yeah, get in touch. Thank you for your time this evening. And we hope to uh, chat with you all again soon. Thank you.